happy Mother's Day to all of you, including the gentlemen. We know that today's chapter, which terminates the thunder of silence, is really a beginning. We've learned several things these past 20 weeks. You might go back a bit further. You might go back in your own life about 10 years. There's a time when most of us were afraid of death. And then even perhaps before you began the study of metaphysics, you may have lost that fear. But in the course of these past 10 years, and certainly now, it should have occurred to you that not only have you lost the fear of death, but you've lost the belief in death. You know that I will never be in a grave. I, the living spirit of God, am not even confined to the period between birth and death. In some way you became aware of a pre-existent you, and then of a you that has incarnated many times and finally, aware that you are a progressive state of consciousness while in the flesh, learning your true identity, and that whatever degree of consciousness you attain, you take with you into your next experience. So that now, life for you should no longer be confined to this period that you occupy in time and space. We should be free of the notion that we are finite, that we are temporary, and possibly free to some extent of the notion that we are material beings. Now that might be the place where we find ourselves today. Aware that we are the spirit, aware that we can attain a spiritual realization which will determine a spiritual tomorrow. For just as the degree of freedom we experience today is determined by what we did yesterday, so that which we do today is determining the degree of freedom that we will experience tomorrow. And now we come to a place where we're ready to be taught by God, not by human teachers and human authorities, a place where we're ready to walk out upon the waters of spirit guided by an inner teacher. To be taught of God is the way to the kingdom of God, for no human mind can ever take you there. And that is our destination. We have seen the folly of governments striving to express their will. We have seen the folly of individuals striving to express their will. We have seen that both the individual and the government express their will with power, physical power, mental power, my power over your power. And we have seen the futility of this power in that it only brings a temporary safety, a temporary protection. And that is because human power whether it be physical or mental, is not power at all. It is our human sense of power. And the will of God is not in our human sense of power. Our human sense of power, lacking the will of God, lacks the power of God. And consequently, it always fails, even when it seems momentarily to succeed. All of us have been experienced for a long time now 
in the futility of our human powers. For always there is someone or something somewhere who shows that our power is a dwarf compared to theirs. And even when you think you're the biggest nation on the earth, you discover you have a false sense of power. And it usually spells tragedy for those who entertain that false belief. Then is the God power. And what is it? And how does it come into our experience? You find a very beautiful truth in the fact that there is a perfect plan not utilized by most, not understood, but nonetheless it exists. And this perfect plan says to you, so perfect is my plan that there is no human being on the face of the earth who can interfere with it. My plan is infallible. It does not depend on human beings, and that is why it is infallible. The divine master plan for this world is completely independent of you and me. It's like the sun. If you want the sunshine and it's on the other corner, you cannot influence it to come to your corner. You must walk across the street. If you want the divine plan to function in you, you cannot bribe it, influence it, persuade it, or manipulate it. You cannot use the spirit. You can learn to let the spirit use you. The infallible plan of the Father says that I am not going to leave the universe of God subject to the interference, the whims, the promises, the personal sense of mankind. If you want a better life, if you want a divine life, you must turn your life over 100% to that perfect plan. It does not brook any personal interpretation that a human being may put upon it. It does not say, here are the powers, here are the keys to the kingdom, do with them as you will. Instead it says, until you get out of the way, my way cannot be your way. It says, I have given you all of the powers in the kingdom, all of the qualities. I have given you a divine inheritance, but I will not let you spend it. You must step aside and let me spend it for you. For I, the Father within, I know my purpose and my will, and you do not. And the method by which the master plan functions in your life is through the still small voice. Until you receive it, you live in this world separated by your mind from the kingdom of God on earth. There is no other way that you can enter the kingdom of God except through the still, small voice. Man has not enjoyed the fruits of the kingdom for that reason. He has not prepared the atmosphere within himself which can receive the still, small voice. And because of it, he walks seeking the kingdom, wanting the kingdom, even praying for the kingdom. And his very prayer is a denial of the qualities that he seeks. Now let's look closely at the still small voice, what it means to you, how it alone can be your shepherd how through it you become the realized child of God. Looking out with your five sense mind, you see a world that is not the world that God made. 
you can see that very clearly by its imperfections and injustices. And as long as you continue to look through this five sense mind, wherever you turn, you will find there is pain, suffering, lack, guilt, fear, ineptitude, weakness, every kind of disaster and catastrophe and disease known to man. And yet it is said that God made the earth. With your sense mind, you will never see that earth that God made. But you will see this earth, which is our mental concept of that earth. My kingdom, the earth that I created, is not of this world. And when men of earth heard that, and when religion heard that, it was decided that my kingdom must be up there, not in this world, away from here. But the still small voice which spoke through the one called Jesus was saying, my kingdom is not of this world, but my kingdom is right here on the place where you stand. God is right here in the midst of you. God is in the still, small voice. And that misunderstanding alone has set man back some 2,000 years hoping to die so that he could arrive someday into the kingdom, pleading to God to lead him to the kingdom, praying amiss. We who have now become pioneers in the spirit explorers, willing, eager, thirsty to seek and to find those hidden wisdoms, we can say with certainty now that there is an earth which God created, which is not this earth that our five cent minds see, and that earth is the kingdom of heaven on earth. It is closer to us than breathing. It is nearer than hands and feet. It is at hand. It is available. It is to be lived on. While we walk this earth, we are to live in this kingdom of heaven on earth. And our guide to it is not the five sense mind which has been a veil a false witness, but that mind, which is the only mind, which seeth the Father in secret, which knoweth the Father, for it is the mind of the Father. It is the mind of the Christ in you, the single eye mind. That mind which sees only the light of the Father and brings that light through as the still small voice expressing, manifesting God where you stand in your very being. We all have that opportunity. As soon as we cleanse ourselves of the beliefs that have made us see through a glass darkly. Now we must face certain facts in a way that the world is not perhaps ready to face as we hope to be. We must face the fact that every time a child dies or an adult dies or a crime is committed or a disaster occurs, that should be a sign to us that that which is material, 
and which is being destroyed by these disasters is not a creation of God. As long as we entertain the notion that God created matter, we are living in a double mind with double vision. God did not create matter. There is no material thing on this earth that God created. And with that belief that God did create matter, we are sowing to matter. We are sowing to the flesh. And that sowing to the flesh reaps corruption because we are in untruth. We are sowing to what we believe. Sowing and believing are almost synonymous, if not synonymous. What you believe is what you sow. What you sow is what you believe. And if you are sowing to matter, believing in matter, you reap the fruit of your own belief. You reap matter which must deteriorate and be destroyed. You reap corruption. Now then, as you look out upon the world, you are looking at matter that God did not create. My kingdom is reality. This world is not my kingdom. Therefore, this world is not my creation. This world is material. Matter is not my creation. My kingdom is not of this world of matter. My kingdom is reality. The world of matter is imitation of reality. And whoever then would prepare the way for the still small voice must overcome the belief that God created this material world and must cr cross over to the knowledge that right where this material world stands there is another universe, the universe called my kingdom, the invisible earth that God did create, which is the very substance of God. We are here to learn how to walk in that invisible universe created of the substance of God. And as we learn the non-reality of physical matter, we are removing the foremost obstacle at this moment. Every error, every problem that you entertain concerns a material person, thing, or condition. And God made none of them. God made no material person, no material thing, and no material condition. And therefore, the bridge between the world of matter, which God did not create, and the kingdom of spirit, which is the very substance of God, must be connected in your consciousness by truth, by the inner baptism of the Spirit, by the inner baptism of fire, by the still small voice which alone comes into your experience, bringing with it divine love, divine wisdom, divine truth, divine reality to dissolve the seeming enemies around you in material form. This is the slow, gradual, narrow path through which we walk 
in order to step out of unreality and to walk in the light, the truth, the spirit, the garden, the kingdom of God on earth. We will look now at matter in another way. What is it? How does it get there? How does it mesmerize us? You fall down. Did you? Who fell down? A physical image fell down. Are you a physical image? No, but your mind thinks you are a physical being. Your mind says you fell down. Spirit says I am all. I did not fall down. You have a disease. Who said so? Your mind says so because it created a physical you. Spirit says, I do not have a disease. Where are you in your consciousness? Are you the physical person who fell down? Are you the physical person who has a disease? Or are you the spiritual individual who knows that God is not in disease? God is not in the whirlwind. God is not in a physical form. God is not in matter. How can I be where God is not? I am not in matter, for I and the Father are one. The Father is not in matter. When a child dies, does God die? When a disease attacks you, does a disease attack God? Is a disease attacking the light of God? the Christ of God, the Spirit of God. We find that because there is no matter, I am not in a material form. I am spiritual being, and therefore not mesmerized by conditions of matter. We find that the human mind, believing itself to be the god of this world, has created its own concept, its own imitation, its own conceptual body. And its conceptual body is this physical form it wants to pin upon us. This very minute will be forgotten in one minute. You've already lost yesterday. The next hour will come and it will go. Always another minute will replace the minute you lost. Where do those minutes go? How many years will you continue to lose those minutes before there are no more minutes to lose? Is God losing minutes? Is God losing years? No, but our physical forms are. Subtly, we have been placed into a form that we are not, which is losing minutes every minute. We are in the wrong life stream. We are in the counterfeit life stream. Subtly, this counterfeit life stream becomes our sense of life. But think right at this second, when our human seconds are flitting away, God is losing nothing. Now God is. Now God is not changing. Now God is not passing in time. Now God is being the same God that walked the earth when Jesus walked the earth. Now God is being the same God who will walk the earth Twenty minutes from now, that spirit of God, which is now and unchanging, is the real life stream. 
And you can find out how powerful it is if you just, with your eyes closed, quietly say, Now, now am I the Son of God. Now God is. Now and here the Spirit of God is. And you let it dwell in you for a moment, and you will see that passing time has no power over your knowledge that God is now. You begin to cease to be that which is passing into yesterday. You begin to be aware that now I am, and now I shall always be. For I am the nowness of God itself. You begin to move into your vertical position, upright, not passing from tomorrow into today into yesterday. You begin to be being itself. You are claiming your birthright, your identity, not in time, in eternity. Now is eternity. Now am I the life of the Father. We have a principle called one life. One life does not permit you to accept that there is another life in the universe other than the life of God. You will find there is no greater principle revealed in the history of man than the principle of one life. There is no discovery ever made since time began that can touch your discovery that one life is all there is. You will find it is the core from which every other truth you need will spring. Without it, there would have been no Jesus Christ. One life, one being, not God is supreme and we are below, but God is the only being, the only life, and that embraces your life and my life. There is no second life. Unfortunately, man has been encouraged to make God a secondary power. The power of disease has rendered God impotent in the eyes of some. The power of evil on this earth has made God impotent in the eyes of others. And all of the powers of this world, of mind and of force, have revealed that God has no power in the world of men. God cannot heal a virus. God cannot straighten a bone. God cannot change the weather. God cannot remove the lightning or the thunder. God cannot heal a sick child. Why? Because the sense mind of man thinks these things are there to be healed, and they are not. God cannot heal perfection, and perfection is the law of the kingdom of God. The imitation universe the counterfeit world of man is never entered by God. And as long as you stand in the counterfeit world, as long as you stand in the sense mind, which are pictures a counterfeit world, you will have evils and wonder why doesn't God do something about them. And those evils are not out there. Those evils are all mental images. They are never external reality in the kingdom of God. And a funny thing should be known. You are not suffering from a disease. You did not fall down. A cosmic image appeared locally and fell down. And you have accepted it as your self. A cosmic image appears locally with a disease and you accept it as yourself. There is no disease in the Spirit of God. Our minds are controlled. 
They are controlled by a cosmic mind. The images that our minds see are nothing more than our outpicturing from within of the images sent to us by the cosmic mind to itself, which is our individual mind. Cosmic television presents through your mind a cosmic lie, which you say is me, a body. But you're really speaking of a body image which you have misidentified. All this is the veil. Jesus did not come to bring truth to earth. Jesus did not come to bring God to earth, but to reveal that truth and God are here on earth, but not through the sense mind of man, which is nothing more than an outlet for the cosmic mind of this world. Jesus revealed that behind it is reality, available to be experienced, and that all who walk in the tomb of the sense mind can rise and shake off that which is not here. We do not have enemies. We do not have problems. We have false beliefs. And these false beliefs are outpictured as our enemies and as our problems. The substance of those false beliefs is cosmic thought. And that thought becomes your thought. When you change your belief, that which you are picture is no longer the false belief, but if your belief happens to be the truth, you will now picture the truth. And so by changing your beliefs to the truth, you change your external world, dissolving the sense images, dissolving those activities which are not of the Father, until the presence felt in your consciousness begins in you to manifest itself as the Word made flesh. You know, many thousands of years ago upon this earth, men and women did not see as you and I do today, nor did they hear this way. There was another way of seeing and of hearing, and the still small voice is the beginning of that for us. It is the return to the way of seeing and hearing. which sees and hears the universe that God did create, and not the universe that mortal mind recreated. In short, the voice is your first glimmer, not of the mind universe of man, but of the soul universe. And you will see with your soul. You will hear with your soul. And what you see and hear will not be of this world. It will come to you from the recesses of your own soul. And you will hear, not a voice with sound, and you will see, not sights that have the same formations and densities and textures that you have been accustomed to, but you will see what human eyes have never seen, hear what human ears have never heard. And that is called living by the word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, through your soul perception. As this proceeds, you will discover that you are just beginning to be introduced to the universe that is. That every moment, every day, is the opportunity to see behind the veil of illusion to experience reality. 
in an exciting new way. A way that was known to the Christ Jesus, to the prophets, to the enlightened ones who walked this earth, a way that they could never convey to the masses. For materialism was too heavy upon the world. And that is the density of the web that you too must break through. In the preparation of an atmosphere through which the voice can enter your consciousness, you must be devoid of the belief that God's power is sharing its throne with any power on the face of the earth. You must be devoid of the belief that God's presence is sharing its throne with any other presence on the face of the earth. You must know that only God's power and God's presence are real, are existent. And you must express that knowing with a consciousness that might be called a trusting consciousness. Do you believe God is here? Do you believe only God is here? Do you believe there is another presence or life than God? Do you believe there is another power than God? And if you have found that you can accept that only God is here, only God's presence is here, only God's life and only God's power, then you can relax. You can relax into my peace. What more is there to fear? When you have that belief, that is what you will outpicture in your experience. Now you will outpicture the harmony of the presence of God of the power of God, of the peace of God. But as long as there is still fear within you, or hate, or even human love, you will discover you still have a barrier. Try to remember this. The human mind that can fear is not capable of being a channel for divine love. The human mind that can hate cannot be a channel for divine love. And the love that it does express will not be divine. It will be a limited, personal, partial, kind of changeable human love. Love that comes in and as the human mind expressing is never going to be that love which opens you up to the voice. It must be a different kind of love. It must be a love that is impartial. A love that has no favorites. A love that says everywhere stands the Christ. You see, the Father doesn't take chances. The Father does not put his universe inside the weakness of the human mind. It must be your Father's will expressing in you. And that means you must make your will, not a second will, but non-existent. Your only will can be the will of the Father in you. And never can you know that will except through the voice itself. My will in you is my voice. And I fulfill myself in you. I reveal myself in you. Make yourself a fifth house for the Lord. For the Spirit of God in you. And then, my will in you reveals the kingdom of heaven on earth. My will in you expresses through the Christ. Only the Christ in you can take you into the kingdom. Never 
through your own personal desires or your own personal motives can you enter reality. When you have been sufficiently aware that your complete demonstration on this earth depends on your receptivity to the voice, then everything you do will be bent in that direction. You will release personal desire, personal ambition, personal seeking of any nature. And rather, right where you are, you will accept yourself to be the living child of God, and you will be hid in Christ. Meek unto the Christ of your own being, knowing that the only life in the universe is the one life everywhere, which you accept, and not only in this passing moment, but you begin to feel that life as not limited to today, not limited to this century at all. For the life of the Father, which is the only life, is throughout all that we call time, past, present, and future, now. You rest in the Word and let it go before you, which means let it permeate your mind and your body. Let it go out to the six continents, and when it returns, maybe even in a year or two, it will return to that which it sought out in those six continents and present it at your doorstep. Let the invisible word do the work. We learn to step aside. We learn to let the human mind drop its defenses and its offenses. We learn to define nothing. We learn to judge nothing. We learn to let the spirit within make every judgment. We learn that it knows what we should do an hour from now, and we don't. It knows what we should do tomorrow, and we don't. It says, my will be done, and only my will. And we learn to trust it. We learn to respect it. We learn by our stillness to honor it. We honor the only presence, the only power, and our silence is the way in which we acknowledge it. If it is present, if it is power, our silence says, Thou art the power, Thou art the presence, I of mine own self can do nothing. And the fidelity with which we maintain that hands-off attitude, permitting the Spirit to reveal itself where we stand, this will determine the demonstration of spiritual footage. It will determine whether or not we are transformed by the renewing of the mind, whether or not we are prepared to receive the priceless gift of life itself, of substance, of spirit, of sustenance and maintenance, of protection and law, of divine activity, of guidance, of love, of truth, of beauty. All this flows only through the still small voice that enters the consciousness which is naked before the Father. 
without outline, without a desire to channel, without a desire to tell the Father what I have prayed for. And now you are listening with your soul to the prayer of the Father in you. For the voice is the Father's prayer in you. It is not your prayer to God that brings forth his will. It is the Father's prayer to you that brings forth his will. This inner prayer is the Lord's prayer in you, functioning living your life so that with Paul you can say I live yet not I we must learn to live this way in trust in confidence in total acceptance that the spiritual universe where I am walking now is totally governed by the power of God that power is the power of perfection without opposite I cannot fall I cannot be hurt I cannot be sick I cannot die the power of the Father is the power of my being for I and the Father are one spirit whatever mishaps occur are but temporary signs that we have in our beliefs accepted the cosmic beliefs and outpictured them not because we were bad not because we were in any way immoral not because we were in any way wishing to live apart from God but because we had not trimmed our lamps we have not remained alert to the fact that there is no life in the universe other than the one divine life. The instant you step out of that knowledge and accept a second life anywhere, you are vulnerable. Because the only way you can know about a second life is through the mind that is not the mind of God. And the minute you step into that mind which knows of a second life, you are in a mind that cannot be fed the inner word. You have separated yourself by having a second mind. That second mind is your lack of fidelity to the one. It is the only sin there is. It does not make you an evil person. For the Father's love is so perfect that the moment you step out of the one mind and become vulnerable, the Father's love is embracing you, waiting for the moment that you will return to the one mind. And there is never a word of reprimand. Seventy times seven and seventy times seven again, we are welcomed back Always, the Father says, if you will abide in me, and let me abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. And that fruit is the perfect eternal life. The life that can walk through the transition of death, independent of all material ties and facts and powers. We must learn this on this side of the veil. To walk in my kingdom after transition, you must first learn to walk in my kingdom on earth. Now then, now, God is the only life. You will find that if you can dwell with the only life in your consciousness, that it has the power to cleanse you of 
material beliefs, beliefs in material powers, beliefs in lacks and limitations, beliefs in disease, beliefs that anything on this earth has power over the one life. And you will watch those false beliefs dwindle away and with them will go the false conditions that they are pictured. No matter how many times you stumble, whenever you return to the knowledge that there is only one perfect life and no other, you will find new strength. And every time you repeat this, you will be multiplying, accelerating, magnifying, and eventually shattering the veil of materialism that separates you from your father's house. I think it was Elijah who spoke about the still small voice. It was Samuel who said, Speak, Father, thy son here. It was every prophet who threw his knowledge that the Spirit of God indwelled him and his fellow men was chosen to receive that voice. And always that voice was saying to the prophet what it has been saying to you and I. I am in the midst of the Almighty. Whosoever believes on me will discover that I am the way, the life, and the resurrection. But you must know that I am the only. Beside me there is no other. Not even you. Let's dwell in the silence a moment, and then we're going to have a little intermission to get our bearings again. I am the only presence in this room. Beside I, there is no other. I am the only power on this earth. Beside I, there is no other. I am the only mind, the only body, the only substance, the only law. I am perfection without end. I am eternal. I am infinite. I am indivisible. I am your being. You are the one being. The one being is you. The I am of your being will teach you that God alone is. And I in the midst of you am that I am. I am the voice of the Father in you, for I am the Father. And I speak only to the Christ, never to a human being. We will, in the period after the intermission, let the eye tell us itself how we are to let it live in us.
have a five or ten minute rest. This is in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. If any man hear my voice, The still small voice stands right outside your consciousness, knocking, waiting for you to say, I hear you, I acknowledge your presence. I acknowledge infinity at my consciousness, waiting for me to let it in waiting for me to drop the false sense of me. That is opening the door. And then infinity will sup with you, will share its infinite table with you. And from the far ends of the universe, all that is needed, all of the divine qualities of the Father must flow in and through you, performing their divine function where you stand. If my kingdom is not of this world, how can my qualities be in this world? How can omnipotence be in this world if it is not my kingdom? The power of God only functions in my kingdom, not in this world. The power of God only functions in the one divine life. There is no other life in which it can function, because there is no other life. If you are in the life of the world, the mental life stream, you have missed the divine qualities in your experience for that reason. Omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience can only function in the one divine life. And when we stand in a state of non-life, by virtue of the belief that we are human life, we are literally preventing ourselves from experiencing the divine qualities of being. You will discover that not only did God not create matter, but God is not even conscious of matter. God is not conscious of the material world. God is not conscious of the material errors. God is not conscious of the material health, of the material peace or the material war, of the material abundance or the material lack. The human mind is conscious of matter, but God is not. That is why we must see that because God does not protect matter, is not conscious of matter, we who are conscious of matter are not living in that which is of God. If you think God is conscious of matter, give it a second thought. Just take a beautiful rose 
and see how conscious God is of that rose. Put it in your hand and squash it and see what God does about it. Put a fire to a tree and watch the forest burn up and see what God does about it. Put a match to a house. Put a bullet to a brain and see what God does about it. Nothing. You can spread diseases all over the army if you want to. God won't stop it. God is not conscious of the matter that God did not create. We are conscious of that matter. Who's right? You know the answer. That is why we are learning to dissolve our material consciousness. God is spiritually conscious. That is why we are learning to be spiritually conscious. So that we can live in the spiritual universe. And so we learn that we cannot dissolve our material consciousness while we are in a human mind. The mind must be transcended. It is when the mind is transcended that we become awake to another realm. And there we find every promise of the Bible already fulfilled in the finished kingdom of God on earth. We thought we had to seek these things forever. And here they have been silently awaiting our recognition through the soul. If this is what we have sincerely sought, the way is clear. I stand at the door and knock. To go another minute or another day or another year without meeting this I. Is to turn away from those things we allegedly seek. I am the will of God. I am the light of God. I am the water and the wine and the truth and the power. I am life itself. I am the still, small voice. And if you were drowning, if you would but know that I can never leave you and trust in me, the water would subside, air would fill your lungs, you would be free because I in the midst of thee am mighty. And whatever problem you may face at any moment, if you will but remember that I in the midst of you am the only power and that I am not in the problem that you see. You will know that error never has God's substance. There is no divine substance in any error. And therefore it is being held there only by one thing alone. The shred of your belief that it is there. Remove the belief and you remove the false substance that is keeping it there. For I, the Father, I, the Spirit, am never in an error. I am never in the whirlwind. I am never in the hurricane. I am never in the pain. I am never in the broken bone. I am never in the lack or the limitation. What is keeping it there? Human belief. The belief that it is there is the substance of the error. There is no divine substance in any error on the earth. 
Remove the belief and watch the errors dissolve themselves. This is one of the great secrets that God never heals anything. For there is nothing to be healed. There is nothing to be improved. And the moment you find yourself thinking there's something to heal and something to be improved, you're in that mind, which is sustaining the image that it thinks is its problem. And that mind is a captive. It is controlled. Its thought is not its own. It has borrowed cosmic thought, and it is out picturing, just like a television set, that which it believes. Its own belief, out pictured, becomes its problem. But God is not in that belief. God is not in that problem, and only God is. In the silence of that mind, we behold the salvation of the Father. In the silence of the mind which believes in error, we behold the perfect universe revealing itself as the ever-presence of God itself. I will sup with you if you open the door, and you with me. And this supping is the divine feast of truth. The table in the wilderness in the midst of thine enemies. The table of truth that can never change, that is independent of every physical appearance on the earth. This supping pushes the mountain of error into the sea. It pierces the veil of ignorance that holds man captive. It banishes every problem, no matter how monumental it appears, to the sense mind. And we are not to wait for a crisis. We are to sup with I now. For I is the only life there is. There is no other. I is not in time. I is not in space. And when you are lifted into I, you are lifted out of the false life stream of dying minutes. I is eternality itself. It feeds you from its infinite storehouse. And no longer are you in the passing time. In I you are not male or female. In I you are not young or old. In I you are Christ. Living the divine life on earth as it is in heaven. And only in I do you break the bubble of time. Only in I do you break the mesmerism of the senses. Only in I does the hypnotism of the world end for you. That's where we sell. Now watch how easy it is for you to violate divine law. The Father says, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved, for I am the Lord thy God, and beside me there is none other. I am the only life there is. I am not the supreme being, I am the only. And then you worry about someone. What about my daughter coming home after 12 midnight? What about my son 
drafted six months ago. What about my husband? Sixty-six. How will we live? These are violations of the knowledge that there is only one life. And as we violate the truth, we invite the lie to act upon us. The lie has no power to act upon us except through our belief in the lie. And you may look at a circumstance, a rib that is protruding, and say, well, what can I do? I can't put it back in. That's not your function. I in the midst of thee. That is my function. I will reveal the truth to you. I will dissolve the illusion of the senses. Every time you step into the belief of any imperfection in your life or in the lives of those around you, you have discovered a second life, a life that is not the life of God. And that makes you more important than God because God knows of no second life. I am the only. And it is this high degree of alertness in you which will prevent you from stepping out of the Garden of Eden every day. There is no second life. Every pain I feel, every despair, every frustration is my belief in a second life. And my suffering is not from my despair or my frustration. These are the decoys. These are the effect of my false belief. I am not suffering from discords. But discords ex exist because of I, my belief that there is another life than God. As I repair my belief, as I contemplate the truth that the Father knows that he is the only and that the Son must learn to accept, then I learned the great meaning of the Sabbath, the resting. Because we are learning to be beholders, not doers. A doer in Christ begins as a beholder in Christ. No one would ever accuse St. Paul of not being a doer. But before he could be a doer, he had to be a witness. To witness the Christ in you, in your neighbor, to rest without judgment, to look without seeing what you see, to none react to the world around you because there is no imperfection in the one life. Even the bomb, the bullet, all of the forms of evil that you see are only beliefs outpictured. They have no substance because God alone is substance. You can knock on them and they will resound. They will be hard. But you are only hearing the hardness of your own belief. The senses will ever be mesmerized into the false sense of reality about that which is not of God and not divinely created. But I, in the midst of you, I can reveal to you the reality where the sense mind sees its false sense of reality. I, in the midst of you, can reveal spiritual abundance. 
I can uh, reveal spiritual lack of limitation. I can reveal spiritual health. I can reveal your spiritual life, which no human mind can do. Your new religion is I. For I, in the midst of you, am the church of God. I am the only church, the true church, the one church which brings the will of the Father in you as you. I am the kingdom of God within you. I am the inner universe. I am your life eternal. And the life that I am is the life of God in you. Through me you can walk through the Father. Through me you will discover that every divine quality of the Father is already functioning in your true being. Now, in the one life, I am the church in all men. I am the infinite life of God on earth. Not distant, not remote, not tomorrow, not yesterday but in the eternal now of being. Whoever follows me walks into the kingdom of God. You will discover that I is your miracle worker. I recognizes only itself in all men and bows to no false powers on the earth. I does not drown in the ocean or fall out of an airplane in the sky. I embraces all it is. I is the miracle of divine life which you are invited to enjoy by opening your consciousness to it, acknowledging it, accepting it, surrendering to it, and then being obedient to it as it dictates to you the will of the Father. That obedience becomes your daily demonstration. You continue in the inner word. I in the midst of you am the inner word. Continue in my word. And you will bear fruit richly. Now, this is the kind of Mother's Day gift we all should give to our children. The understanding that their identity is the one life. They are not separate and apart from God. They are not separate and apart from us. For the one life is indivisible. Its power is functioning throughout itself on earth now. We're recognized, we're acknowledged, we're accepted, it makes itself manifest. Well, you even find that when you talk to a leaf or a tree, you get a response. When you acknowledge the one life, it acknowledges you within itself. Dwell with that a moment now. you'll see that the mortal mind in you will challenge that. It wants to condemn. It wants to evaluate. It wants to grade people of A, B, C, and D. But you can't grade the one life. It is perfect. Nevertheless, it may have an ugly face or a pretty face. It may have a skinny figure or a fat figure. Don't let it fool you. Only the one life is there. And know that the one life is ever complete and perfect and will ever demonstrate the perfect harmonious life where you stand with nothing ever missing. 
To a human mind, it may seem temporarily I am lacking something I want. But don't be fooled. There is nothing missing in your one perfect life. It is the life of God. It will stretch out into planets unknown to pluck for you that which is yours and bring it directly to you in an instant if necessary. Its will will be done and is being done. Don't stand on the wrong side of the street waiting for the sun to come over there. Accept the presence of that one life now. Surrender. Give yourself to it and it will give itself to you. The voice is never heard with the outer ear. It is not even heard with the inner ear. It is heard with the soul. All of the five senses are fragmentary imitations of the one soul. The ear on the outer is an imitation of the quality of hearing in the soul. The eye is an imitation of the quality of seeing in the soul. All of the five senses are counterfeits, giving us a fragmentary idea of that which the one soul ever does perfectly. And when you hear the voice, it is a soundless sound. It is God the Father speaking to God the Son. Just think, if you wanted to, you could pick up a phone right now and dial Chicago. Nobody could stop you. But if somebody in Chicago wanted to, they could pick up the phone right now and dial you. Nobody could prevent it. Do you think we can do anything that God cannot do? Do you not see that God can dial you anytime, anywhere? In fact, that God has already done that and has set up a perfect system whereby there is continuous communication between God and you. Do you not see that the telephone is but a pale imitation of what God has already completed within you? The communication from God to you is continuous and uninterrupted. God communicates with you by having planted within you the Christ. God communicates with the Christ and there is a constant communion going on. If you're tuned out, it's your loss. If you're tuned in, you hear the voice. It's always going on. And that voice, that soundless sound, is much more than a voice. It is the source of life itself and the life and the effect that that life produces. It is the government of that life. It is the nourishment of that life. It is the allness of God functioning in the midst of you. And it will always come to you not only as a voice but as an experience, whatever is needed at that moment will be the experience that will appear. This is grace, and nothing can stop it. Grace is knocking at the door of your consciousness 24 hours a day. Open your consciousness, and it will suck with you. The opening is the rejection of your sense mind, of your personal sense of life, of your material consciousness, your willingness to sit in silence with no human aid, with no need or seeking of human power, of physical power, of mental power, not even of spiritual power. 
in the knowledge that only the one life is. And when you can do that, you have accepted there is only one life. But when you accept that there is only one life, why would you seek a power when the one life is the only power? And so, each disciple learns, I must put my hands behind my back, I must put my sword back in the scabbard, I must release myself from every plan to maneuver, manipulate, seek or strive or plead or pray, and trust the one life to do its perfect job where I stand, 100%. Then am I taught by God. Then am I the Christed one. Then am I ushered in to the kingdom. As long as you have this merest iota of defense or caution or fear, or human emotion. Anything that prevents you from being a total transparency for the Christ within will be a shadow preventing the perfect demonstration of sonship. But the way has already been prepared for you to be that son. And that way is the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the senses, the Sabbath of the brain which receiveth not the things of God, the Sabbath of the human false personality, the eternal Sabbath resting in the Father. Thy will is being done, for there is no other life than thee. I have no sword. This builds the atmosphere in which the voice will come. That's how you open your consciousness. You trust your father. One hundred percent. In spite of every appearance to the contrary. Father, in you there is no evil, and there is no outside of you, for you are infinite. Evil has no existence in my consciousness. It has none in yours, and now I am seeing with the same eye as you. There is no evil in the Father's consciousness. As long as evil exists in mine, I am saying that there are two lives. So my work is on me. I see no evil in my consciousness. Nothing can enter to defile my consciousness. Who convinceth me of sin? I am honoring the Father. Abiding in the knowledge of one life and no other, no second. My friend, my enemy, both are that one life. How can they be enemies? Only in appearance. We have no enemies in the one life. We have only the one Christ. Everyone is a neighbor in Christ. You see, we're cleansing the temple, getting rid of the money changes, making our house hospitable for the entrance of the Spirit. And coming then under divine law, the one power. In this manner, you will be prepared through transformation 
for the life eternal. Made immaculate as you are in the image of the Father. All that is not of the Father is dissolved. There was one who did this, John, and because of it, he received the voice which gave the world a revelation of St. John. And those soul symbols which have baffled the world contain within them the truth about us, our being, our true life our reality and the reality of all men. We have through the sermon on the mount learned how to empty out, to purify, to release the old ways and to let in the new. That purification which must continue is necessary to prepare a way for the voice. Revelation can never enter until we have been purified of material consciousness. And in the measure that we have been cleansed, in that measure will the voice now enter with revelation as it did for John, enabling us to receive the wisdom from the Spirit itself instead of from the mouths of men. That's perhaps why we've been led now to study John more closely than we did three years ago. Much that is new has been revealed. Much that you have learned has made you a more fitting instrument for the Spirit. And in this new series, we will learn how to live in the will of God. I've sent out notices to all of you. You receive them in Monday morning's mail. You can pick them up from the little platter out there on the, in the little ante room if you wish. And the purpose of the revelation of St. John will be to reveal the way to Christhood you'll discover it's exactly what you've been doing these past 20 weeks. Preparing a way for the living voice of the Father in you. The secret of all scripture the secret of the Sermon on the Mount, the secret of the Holy Bible, is one life. Every word, every syllable, is pointed to make you know that only divine life exists. That you may drop all belief that there is any other kind of life, any other kind of presence, any other kind of power. And from that knowledge will come your peace. And you will find it to be a peace that will eliminate every remnant of fear and doubt. For with that peace comes the still small voice. And from that moment on, behold, I make all things new. I reveal the earth that my Father created before the foundations of this world. Walk ye in it. These past 20 weeks have been a great joy. We have all shared some interesting things. I hope we are all the better for it. It's been very
very, very rewarding to know that there are those in this city who are ready for the highest teaching about the Father, who are not willing to compromise, but who wish to walk in the garden on earth as it is in heaven. That is the kind of class we shall continue to have. And of course, you're all very welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Contact us if you need further spiritual assistance. Our premium audios are now available on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple, and Google Podcasts. Please search for Master Spiritual Awareness. Thank you.